Thank you, Nancy, for coming to our, my presentation about looking into food balance and ingredients. I want to thank you for coming and participating so that we can share, I can share some of these things and then you can give me feedback as well um, on what we've learned actually about uh, what food balance is and how to read food labels and ingredients. Well, thank you for inviting me and I'm looking forward to what you have to share with me and us today. Thank you. Today we're gonna, our outline, our presentation topics are um, why food labels um, are so important to us. Um, we were gonna talk about growing and buying food, the differences um, and also the psychology behind food placement, um, some controversial ingredients, um, some examples of what you can choose to make uh, better decisions um, of healthier options. Um, some gardening um, information with mental health, um, which may not be something that people connect. And then of course, some common food labels that um, we have seen and have um, probably have read about, but really uh, are not familiar with because we're not always on that mindset of you know memorizing these things basically. So anyways, I just wanted to start there and I'll give you a heads up of what's coming up. So good to know. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah. So the first thing I wanted to point out is this quote that I found um, that was so interesting because it kind of pinpointed um, something very deep um, and very profound. Um, if you listen to your body when it whispers, you won't have to hear it scream. Um, wow. This is a lot. I know it says a lot because it's, it goes to show you that our bodies are wonderfully made. Um, and so uh, God designed us in a way that, you know, we're, if we would just listen, <laughs> we could probably hear some things and get some information prior to us getting sick. Um, you know, it's just something that we need to be more mindful of. One of the things that I start out with is why are food labels so important? Because it's kind of like a necessary hobby is what I call it. We all have these hobbies that we enjoy doing or whatever, but um, reading food labels is just as important. And I think it's something that we all should be doing. So I thought, okay, let me just start off with two main points to everybody to understand. Um, you know, the whole concept. Good verifiable food labels can be your guide in the supermarket aisle and at the farmer's market, leading you to food that has been raised and produced in a way that aligns with your values, um, which is something we need to really think about. Um, if you, number two, if you want to purchase something strawberry flavored, the ingredient list needs to say strawberries. Otherwise there's nothing natural about the flavor. Natural flavors are a bit of a cheat by the flavoring industry because you can literally produce a flavor from a bacteria and call it a natural flavor. You said so, a bacteria? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, so my suggestion is beware of the natural flavors terminology. If you want to avoid artificial flavors and colorings, I say avoid it altogether. Um, another important quote that I found was um, the food you eat can either be the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. Um, because we're not a, because we're not aware of everything that's in our ingredient in the ingredients of a food of uh, food items, we tend to disregard or just kind of like not educate ourselves in these things and not realizing that just a little bit is just enough to get you in the long run. So it's a good thing to be mindful of that, you know, these things, if they're not helping us, they're hurting us. Right. Exactly. So the other main thing that I always uh, try to remind people of is that, you know, people are studying just like oh, we study to learn something. People are studying to figure out ways that they can get us to buy what they want us to buy, right? So there's a psychology behind the food placement. Did you know that there's a, there's a psychology behind this? It's kind of like, you don't really think about it because you just go grocery shopping, right? So they don't just put the grocery randomly. No, it's not random. It's, it's a particular- There's a reason why to be where it is. That's, That's what you're saying. saying. Exactly. There's a reason for everything that they do out there. It's a marketing trick, if you want to call it something. And here are some marketing tricks that they try. Um, one of these is, product placement. And it has to do with the fact that certain name brands pay for more money. So they're going to pay for the best um, eye level uh, aisle. Um, really? Yeah. 
they're they're the ones that will pay for that. So you'll find certain brands that you know can afford that. Um, can but, I ask you then? Can I ask you real quick then? So you're saying that when I go to the grocery shop and I'm standing on the the cashier ready to pay. And they have all those candies, all those snack bars, or that chocolate and chips and whatever and whatnot. They're just paying a little more than everybody else so they can be there. And I have to have those conversations with my children where like, no, we cannot have candies. But that's where they are. They're just right there. Right. Just and for that, them to grab them is at, at their level. So they're doing that on purpose. Exactly. It's at eye level for us to notice and, and obviously buy the product. So it is intentional, yes. And uh, we'll talk about a little bit about the shelf layout later, but um, the, the, going by the list, um, I have shopping carts are made bigger. I don't know if you know that, but shopping carts are actually made bigger so that you, you buy more and you feel kind of bad for having less than the next person next to you. <laughs> oh, wow. I didn't never thought about that. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting concept, but it makes you feel kind of like, well, you're not you know rich enough to buy enough food or whatever or you feel poor or whatever mm. uh, yeah it's, actually that does make sense now that i think yeah. about. but like i said all these tricks that they try and get uh for you to purchase their products um another one is pricing uh game of using the 99 cents 98 cents 79 cents when in fact you know math and we know that all those numbers round up to the dollar uh, the next dollar amount so if it says 4.99 it actually is five dollars so plus um, tax. yeah, plus tax. Thank you. Because every, and every city is different too. So you may get a tax that's higher. So yeah. Um, packaging ploys, um, they use different shapes so that it looks bigger or it looks smaller so that you have to get more. Um, there's a, the one with the false sense of urgency by having deals like the dollar deals or the, the ones that are limited for a certain season or whatnot so that they make you feel like it's only here right now at this moment. Um, so yeah. And then, uh, a few other ones are like slow music to calm you down so that you feel, um, more relaxed at the grocery store. You kind of hang out basically. Um, and then there are coupon receipts that they put in your receipts, um, as well as in the newspaper where they basically get you to come back. I see that. I can see that because you're thinking you're going to come and get 20% off. So you're going to buy more stuff because you're getting 20% off. You know, they do these pretty things by putting these flowers in the front doors of the grocery store. So everything looks pleasant and beautiful. Um, there's bigger, uh, um, no, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. There's a produce freshness that kind of entices you to, to look and it looks wonderful and beautiful in the front. So when you walk in, that's the first thing you see. Um, they also put the bakery in the back. And the reason why they do that is, of course, the smells. You know, you got this bakery smell coming in as you walk in the store. And it kind of brings you back into the store. So you walk all the way back. That gets um, me every time. Oh, yeah. The smell of those um, mm. baked, baked bread and things. <laughs> Big goods. goods, yes. That's right. And then, of course, they put the grab-and-go items in the front checkout, which is what you mentioned earlier. It's like the candies and the things that they brought, they put in the front to entice your kids um, to, you know, take the last few, there's one more chance to get you to buy more basically junk food. Yes. Um, another another uh, thing that they do is put the bank in the store uh, to make you feel resourceful so that you can, you know, not feel like if you run out of money, you can always go to the ATM and get more or whatever. Um, so it's always there as a resource. Um, I don't know if you know what end caps are, but it's like you have an aisle and then you have at the end of the aisle, there's like what they call an end cap. Oh, okay. End caps show displays and they usually show popular items or items that are, you know, uh, going like popular as in they're selling a lot right now. I've seen those. They have like the potato chips or they have the tortilla chips and mm -hmm. the avocados and the whole to make it like, you know, just recently we had Cinco de Mayo, right? So they had the chips, the avocado, the tomatoes, and they make it look so nice and pretty exactly. with all those chips. That's right. And then, of course, like at Costco, for example, they have the sample or demonstrations to entice your taste buds so that you can try it and then buy it. So that always is another thing. And even in Costco, they have the deli and coffee shop and um, other grocery stores will have like a pharmacy. And the, the thing about the pharmacy is that what, what that does is that once you're in there, you have to wait for your prescription. So if you have to wait, then you'll go shopping and spend more money. 
So that's another ploy that uh, also works. Um, along with the dairy products and meats that they put basically staple items in the back that they know people are gonna come in for. Um, and then of course the impulse buys, which are the candy, the magazines, the drinks, et cetera, that you just, it looks so pretty or they look um, enticing and you know, it could be because you feel thirsty and all of a sudden you just wanna grab a pop right. or whatever in your hand. Um, but back to what we were saying about the shelf layout, um, they are strategically placed. Um, and there's even, like I mentioned, the eye level, there's even a, a, an adult level and a child level um, so that the sugary items are more uh, kind of catered toward the kids and they do more colors and cereal boxes have more, um, you know, cartoon figures or things that toys or things like that that will entice children to buy those cereal boxes instead of the healthier options. So this is where you have to kneel down every time I want to get the Cocoa Puffs or the Cheerios or whatever, because it's intended for the children to have the other eye level. Right. They, they're going to entice them um, with those things so that the parents have a hard time saying no. Okay. Quick portable uh, foods are now the norm in, um, in our society, whether it's a toaster pastry, tube of yogurt, can of cola, or individually wrapped um slices of cheese chances are the product is heavily processed and um it's there to they add these additives and chemicals to preserve its shelf life um and did you know that these convenient foods which commonly come with unpronounceable ingredients may come at a dangerous price various food additives and chemicals have shown side effects which range from nausea to headaches to more serious conditions like cancer alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis. So my suggestion is be sure to read your ingredients uh, labels carefully and consume more whole foods. Um, so can I ask you something real quick? If I can't pronunciate the ingredient, I shouldn't be buying it. Basically, I mean, there are a lot of things that, um, you know, we, you know, we're not going to know the name of every chemical out there, every uh, chemical, you know, product or additive. Um, but if it's hard to pronounce, most likely it is not a healthy item. I mean, there, there are certain scientific names for certain things, but they shouldn't be so hard to pronounce, seriously. Um, well, here's a 12 of the most pervasive and detrimental additives and substances commonly found in processed foods. <laughs> One of them is artificial sweeteners. And um, the artificial sweeteners are combinations of chemicals used to make our food sweeter without the added calories. Um, the, there's refined sugar. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but we're consuming about half a cup of sugar a day and not even aware of it because they put sugar in basically every product. MSG is another common food additive to enhance flavor that's been used. And some places have now stopped using it because they've realized there's a connection to cancer. Um, artificial colors, synthetic or synthetic chemical uh, chemicals produced by scientists to increase the appeal of food, uh, but it's made from coal tar and can even contain lead and arsenic. So it's pretty bad. Wow, this is artificial colors? Artificial colors. Lead and arsenic. Yeah. Wow, that's something to really look out for. Exactly. Um, BHA and BHT uh, in food, it's a food additive. Um, it, it prevents oils from going rancid, but reasonably deemed as a carcinogen. I mean, it, it's, you can even find it in cereal. I don't know if you've ever read cereal boxes, but it can be found in there because it's just supposed to mean to preserve it. Um, sodium nitrate is another preservative added to processed meats and it enhances their red color in meat, which transforms into cancer causing agents in the stomach. Ooh, that's not good. I know. Okay, so the next one is um, the next six uh, more controversial ingredients. You have a lustra, which I had never heard of till I did my study here. Um, it's a synthetic fat not absorbed by the digestive tract. Um, BBO is brominated vegetable oil, um, and it's meant to keep flavor oils in soft drinks and store in body fat. Um, we all know about caffeine. Uh, it's an addictive stimulant and we all know that, but did you know that it causes calcium to be excreted from the bones as well? Um, it's pulling calcium out of our bones. Exactly. And, and that may be something detrimental to some of us, obviously. 
um, partially hydrogenated oils. Uh, it's, it's reaction when mixed with hydrogen causing the good fat to reduce and trans fat to increase. And it's also used to enhance appearance and increase shelf life. Now, since we last spoke, because I know you and I have spoken before about these type of things, we're, we're on this health journey, is that the Food and Drug Administration ruled in two, 2015 that artificial trans fat were unsafe to eat and gave food makers three years to eliminate them from the food supply with a deadline of June 2018. So supposedly these trans fats um, should be out of um, the market. The markets, yeah. And there are countries, there are a list of countries all over the world that have taken this out of their food products already, um, totally. So, you know, it's, it's a positive, we're moving in the right direction, but it's sad that we are just recently doing that in the last, you know, five years. So, oh, wow. to, to, to note. Uh, pesticides, we all have heard about it, but did you know that there's about 10 pounds per person per year and many are carcinogenic for us? These pesticides, they lay on all the foods. What do you mean 10 pounds per person per year? What does that mean? That we're, we're, we're eating 10 pounds of pesticide each year? Right. Because remember, they're putting it on the food and that's the food you eat. So by the end of the year, by the time you have consumed all your food for the year, they're estimating about 10 pounds per person per year. Pesticides. Pesticides. You're talking about pesticides. Oh, yes. my goodness. Yes. And then of course, genetically modified organisms, which they refer to GMOs, um, plants or animals with modified DNA. And in the USA, the majority are corn, soybean, cotton, and canola crops. These are the ones that they're now genetically modifying and creating just to uh, feed the, the public. I mean, it's, it's becoming an issue. So they're trying to make enough for everybody. So that's, that's pretty sad to hear. Uh, these common food labels, whether on a package of eggs or in your grocery store or in a menu in your favorite restaurant, words like you hear words like free range, grass fed, natural, organic, and they're everywhere these days. Um, many of these food labels can be confusing. So knowing what a food label truly means is a great way to educate yourself about where your food comes from and how it's being produced. Right, so, right. Like uh -huh. I know some of these labels that you have, but I don't know all of them. Right. And we, and we don't because we, you know, it's not something we're constantly watching for, but they're everywhere. So here's a list of common food claims. There's always new food label claims popping up. So if you come across a new phrase, <laughs> try to take some time to do your own research and learn what it really means, because this is what I have uh, for today. Uh, for example, like this one, fair trade certified. Um, these are products that must be produced in accordance with the following fair trade guidelines. Uh, workers must receive fair wages, safe and equitable working conditions, and the right to join trade unions. Child or forced labor is completely prohibited. Crops must be grown, produced, and processed in a manner that supports social, economic, and environmental development. So that's something that, you know, you wouldn't have known just by looking at that label, but that's what that means. And so that's a nice, uh, if you stand on those values, you can support that. Um, the AGA is another one, American grass-fed um, logo on a product shows that the animals were raised on a diet of 100% forage allowed to roam open pasture with no feedlot confinement, never given antibiotics or hormones and come from American family farms. Mm. So that's another one. Uh, another one that um, new to me that I didn't even realize was the certified naturally grown um, foods. Uh, this offers peer review certification to farmers and beekeepers producing food for their local communities by working in harmony with nature without relying on synthetic chemicals or GMOs. Uh, some farmers have criticized the cost and process they need to go through to, to participate in the USA's organic program. So then they go to the certified naturally grown um, as an alternative. I see. Yeah. So let's just break down some of these because some of these we know of, but we don't really know what it means. So like antibiotic free means an animal wasn't given antibiotics during its lifetime. Uh, Cage-free means the birds were raised out of cages. What it does, doesn't tell us is whether the birds were raised outdoors or on pastures or indoors in overcrowded conditions. Oh. So we don't know that. Yes. Uh, free range can be used as long as the producers allow the birds some access to the outdoors. It doesn't necessarily mean the products are cruelty-free or antibiotic-free or that the animals spent the majority of their time outdoors. 
Claims are defined by the USDA, okay? But aren't verified by third-party inspectors, okay? So that's the difference that we need to pay attention to. Mm, yes. That's interesting. I know. So it the can fair- be a little deceiving. Exactly. And like I mentioned about the fair trade label, which means farmers and workers often in developing countries have received fair wages and work in acceptable conditions. So that's something that, you know, we want obviously to support. To support, yes. Exactly. Um, grain fed means that the, if you check the label for 100% vegetarian diet claim to ensure that the animals were given uh, feed containing no animal byproducts. Okay, so they're grain fed or grass fed. Animals were fed grass, their natural diet rather than grains, animal byproducts, synthetic hormones or antibiotics to promote growth or prevent disease. Um, although they may be given antibiotics to treat diseases. So that's one thing that they still can give them, okay? Um, if they're grass, grass fed. Um, Non-GMOs are the genetically modified organisms, um, which are plants or animals that have not been genetically engineered with DNA from bacteria, viruses, or other plants and animals. And that's what that, that means when it's non-GMO. Um, when it's hormone-free, term prohibited by the USDA, believe it or not, but animals that were raised without added growth hormones can be labeled no hormones administered or no added hormones. By law, hogs and poultry cannot be given any hormones. If the meats you're buying aren't clearly labeled, you're supposed to ask your farmer or butcher if they're free of hormones. So there's a technicality there that we need to pay attention to those hormone-free um, yes, there's a lot of little details and a lot of little things that can be deceiving based on your, you know, what do you want to support and what your belief system is too. So it's a lot, a lot of digging that you got to do and research to understand exactly. what we can be consuming or not. Right. Like the term healthy, for example, it's our another, it's another word that's out there. Healthy must be low in saturated fat um, and contain limited amounts of cholesterol and sodium. Certain foods must also contain at least 10% of the following nutrients. So they have to have vitamin A, C, or C, iron, calcium, protein, or fiber. Um, now, currently, there's no standards exist for this label except when used on meat and poultry products. The USDA guidelines state that natural meat and poultry pr products can only undergo minimal processing and can't contain any artificial colors or flavors, preservatives, or other artificial ingredients. However, natural mm. foods aren't necessarily sustainable, organic, humanely raised, or free of hormones and antibiotics. So that's another catch that we're not really paying attention to if, uh, when we see the word natural. Um, mm. So something to think about. Um, but what's interesting is that if a product is con the, like considered organic, what's interesting about that is that um, it means that it's 95 to 100% of its ingredients are organic. Products with 70 to 95% uh, organic ingredients can still advertise organic ingredients on the front of the package. And products with less than 70% organic ingredients can identify them on the side panel. Organic foods prohibit the use of hydrogenation and trans fat, which is a good, obviously good That's step. Okay. Yeah. But uh, it's interesting how the percentages also uh, is a little, it's kind of like the fine print. <laughs> yes, like you got to get a master's on how to read labels because there's so much information that is given out to the public. Right. But the, you know, that information is limited. There's so much more behind that, like you just said in the fine print. Exactly. There's so much more we don't know about. Right. And of course, the last one uh, that we have here, uh, vegan, which is a popular one nowadays, um, is the symbol used in products that don't contain animal products or byproducts, including silk or dyes from insects and animal derived GMOs or genes and haven't been tested on animals. So that's one thing that, um, you know, has it, it turned into a fad, but uh, that's another one that um, has become a popular thing um, nowadays. But I think that one's the, the most clear one out of all the rest of them. That's just like, yes, it's vegan. There's no animal on it. This is it. And, and you'd be surprised because I've seen products where they say they're vegan and they have some form of egg product in it. <laughs> but you still have to read the labels. I'm telling you, it's amazing how um, it's, wow. it's not understood in the, in the right way. 
Um, so here are a couple of nutrition facts labels to examine. The US Food and Drug Administration requires a nutrition fact label on most packaged goods mm -hmm. um, and beverages. At the top of the nutrition facts label, you will find the total number of servings in the count container and the food or drink serving size. The serving size on the label is based on the amount of food that people typically eat at one time and is not a recommendation of how much to eat, right? Um, the rest of the nutrition information on the label is usually based on one serving of the food or beverage, but can be for the whole container. So you see food label A, right? The example on nutrition facts on label I A. See it. Mm -hmm. However, if the container has more than one serving, but could be consumed in one sitting, such as a pint of ice cream, the label will have two columns, okay? That's when you see food label B. The first column lists the calories and nutrients in one serving, and then the second column lists the calories and nutrients in the entire container. If you eat a whole package of food that contains two servings, you will get twice as many calories, nutrients, sugar, and fat as in one serving. So that's something to note that um, when you see the both columns, that's what that's saying. Mm, I see. Exactly. So the interesting thing is that they've come up with this new label um, and it's a little different than what we had before. Um, while much of the new labels look isn't drastically different uh, from the old one, the information and layout have been revamped. Uh, according to the FDA's announcement, the most notable difference between the old and the new label include increasing the type size for calories, servings per container and the serving size, okay? Uh, and this is uh, serving size declaration and bolding the number of calories, if you notice, um, and the serving size that's also been bolded de declaration to highlight this information, requiring mm -hmm. manufacturers to declare the actual amount in addition to percent daily value of vitamin D, calcium, iron, if you notice that at the bottom as well, and potassium. Right. Um, they, can, they can voluntarily declare the gram amount for other vitamins and minerals too. Um, changing the footnote to better explain what percent daily value means, it will read, the percentage daily value tells you how much a nutrient in a serving of food contributes to a daily diet. And they usually refer to this under 2000 uh, calories a day, uh, general nutrition advice. So adding the added sugars declaration directly beneath the listing for total sugars, if you notice that as well, uh, removing calories from fat because research uh, shows the type of fat is more important than the amount. Okay. So serving sizes must be based on amounts of foods and beverages that people are actually eating, not what they should be eating. So can you say that again for me? Okay. So adding the added sugars, um, do you see that on that, uh, where it says total sugars and then on it the says bottom, added right? sugars? The okay. mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it's, it's a way of showing you that this is 10 grams of these are added to the, they're added sugars to the product. So remember the sugars that are already on that product can be like already a sugar product, like fruit. Fruit has a lot of sugar, right? So right, right. Can have sugar, but these are added sugars that they've added. So that's like a declaration that they can put on there. Um, they also put the remove, they removed calories from fat, which used to be on there on the old one. That's not there anymore. Um, oh. Yeah, they just have the amount per serving um, for the calories. I see that. Because they're, they, that wasn't relevant anymore. Um, and because the serving sizes must be based on amounts of foods and beverages that people are actually eating, not what they should be eating. Oh. Yes. Uh, did you know that the ingredients listed in descending order by weight, that they're listed in descending order by their weight? Um, basically, that is that the ingredient that weighs the most is listed first and the ingredient that weighs the least is listed last. Oh, I didn't notice that. Yeah. So that's something to know when you see the ingredients section. So reading labels can be tricky. I mean, let's be honest, that was confusing as it is even going through it myself. Um, yes. Consumers are more health conscious than ever these days. So, so some food manufacturers use misleading tricks to convince people to buy highly processed and unhealthy products. Food labeling regulations are complex, making it harder for consumers to understand them. One of the best tips may be to completely ignore claims on the front of the packaging. So don't buy what it says on the, on the package. Low sodium, still read the label, okay? Front labels try to lure you into purchasing products by making them 
uh, help by making these health claims, right? In fact, wow. research shows that adding health claims to front labels makes people believe a product is healthier than the same product that doesn't list health claims. And so that affects the consumer choices, right? Um, manufacturers are often dishonest in the way that they use these labels. Um, they tend to use health claims that are misleading and in some cases downright false. Um, and the examples of those include many high sugar breakfast cereals like whole grain cocoa puffs. I mean, seriously. How can a cocoa puff be whole grain? <laughs> yes, how is that possible? I do not understand that. Exactly. So despite what the label may imply, these products are not healthy. This makes it hard for consumers to choose healthy options without a thorough inspection of the ingredients list. Product ingredients are listed by quantity from highest to the lowest, just like I mentioned. And this means that the first ingredient is what the manufacturer used the most of, okay? A good rule of thumb to follow is to scan the first three ingredients and then they as they make up the largest part of what you're eating, just so you know that. The first three ingredients are the main thing in that product. If the first ingredients include refined grains or a type of sugar or hydrogenated oils, you can assume that that product is unhealthy, just straight out unhealthy. So mm -hmm. instead, you should try choosing items that have whole foods listed as the first three ingredients. And in addition, an ingredients list that is longer than two to three lines suggest that the product is highly processed. Okay? You, said, you said if the ingredients on the back are two to three lines, it's already- Longer than processed. two to three lines, then you should already assume that that product is highly processed. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot of things we don't know about and you know, don't, don't, cause we don't know what we don't know, right? Exactly. And nutrition labels state how many calories and nutrients are in a standard amount of the product, often a suggested single serving. So every time you see a product, it also tells you one serving. And like we mentioned before, it's usually something that we eat more of. Um, the servings are really small, you know. Um, yeah. so, so we think that because, you know, a package, because it's so easier to just think about a package of cookies. We think that, you know, one serving can be just that roll of cookies, when in reality, it's maybe three cookies or four cookies that is one serving. Right. Right. That's, yeah. Even chips. You can count the chips. On that's the right. Side. There's like, I think it's like nine chips that uh, that's what those chips on the nutrition label will, will be for. It's for those nine chips. So, you know, how many times you sit with a bag of chips and eat nine chips, you know, you're you not don't. Them. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. Yeah, exactly. So some of these label claims, uh, did you know that the ingredients are, uh, we talked about that they're listed in, in this descending order and it's like, something that we need to pay attention to because, you know, we, we read these ingredients, but are we really paying attention to, you know, why they're put in that order? Um, and then there's also like products like that say light products um, that are processed to reduce either calories or fat. You know, remember a day when that was such a big deal. Some products are simply watered down. Um, check carefully to see if anything has been added instead like sugar. Um, multigrain, for example, this sounds very healthy, right? But only means that a product contains more than one type of grain. These are most likely refined grains, unless the product is marked as whole grain. So there's a difference between multigrain and whole grain. So that's something to pay attention to because you have to read the label to discover if it's a whole grain or not. Uh, the other one was the natural, which we talked about before. This doesn't necessarily mean that the product resembles anything natural. It simply indicates that at one point, the manufacturer worked with a natural source like apples or rice originally, right? And then they made whatever they were gonna make out of it. Um, so that's something to pay attention. And of course, we talked about organic. Um, this says very little about whether a product is healthy. For example, organic sugar is still sugar, right? No added sugar. Some products are naturally high in sugar. The fact that they don't have added sugar doesn't mean that they're healthy. So that was part of the label thing that we spoke about. Unhealthy sugar substitutes may also have been added. So you have to pay attention to those details in there because once again, you know, one label to another doesn't mean it's better. We have to pay attention to exactly that product and what it says there. Um, another popular one was low calorie. Uh, low calorie products have to have one third fewer calories than the brand's original product. So that's like the, the claim that they're making. Yet one brand's low calorie version may have similar calories as another brand's original. So something to pay attention. Uh, the low fat usually means that the fat has been reduced at the cost of adding more sugar. 
So once again, read the labels. Uh, low carbs. Um, I don't know if you've known about low carb diets, but they've been linked to improved health. So still processed foods that are labeled low carb are usually still processed junk foods, similar to processed low fat foods. So it all falls in the same category. Um, and then of course, those made with whole grains, the product may contain very little whole grains. And it's asking you to check the ingredients if it says whole grains, 100% whole wheat and things like that. Um, because if it's not the first three, then, you know, it's, it's probably not going to be the most healthy for you. I don't know if you've ever heard of fortified or enriched um, in milk or things like that. So this yes. means that some nutrients have been added to the product. For example, vitamin D is often an added to milk. So what, what it's, what's happened is that they take this product, they strip it of everything it has, the natural in it. And then they make the product, process it, and then add and enrich it with other products. So basically, when you start eating food without labels, you no longer need to count calories. Because if you just stick with the whole foods, you're better off and healthier. Let me just say that. <laughs> yeah, having all these additives to it doesn't sound like it's healthy at all anyway. Well, to me, it sounds very scientific. That's why I have this picture here to show you that, <laughs> you know, do you want your food to be scientifically made? Um, you know, there's like uh, things that say fruit, fruit flavored, for example. Um, many processed foods have a name that refer to a natural flavor, such as like strawberry yogurt. Um, and they may not even include any strawberry at all, only chemicals designed to taste like that fruit. Like taste like strawberry, but they're exactly. not. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of zero trans fats. Um, mm -hmm. it's yes, I have. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be less than 0.5 grams of trans fat per serving. Um, so if we know that the serving sizes are misleading, then the product may still contain trans fat. So, you know, that's something to pay attention to. Well, despite these cautionary words, many truly healthy foods are organic, whole grain or natural. Still, just because a label makes certain claims doesn't guarantee that it's healthy. So we just want to make sure that our food is not made in a science lab is what we're coming down to. <laughs> I know, so, right? Sounds like it. Yeah, so we, we have to consider growing our food and, and how much of our food are we growing and how much of our food are we buying? So have you ever wondered whether growing your own food is worth the time and effort it requires? Does that ever cross your mind? Well, you know, it's, a, it's I mean, if you think about it, if I go and think about my grandparents, they, they grew their food. So they would bring fruit and vegetables and things like that home. So we knew, I would consider now that really organic because there was no pesticides. The earth also was, right. my grandpa worked on the earth before um, doing his um, gardening or growing and that makes a difference. And I don't think that's where we at now. Exactly. Um, so we ask ourselves, why garden? Why, why do this? When you can so easily and more conveniently nowadays buy produce right. grocery store, we have this, you know, all this stuff in front of us. What's well, a fair question um, and, and let's address some of those topics like in, in growing food and buying food that maybe goes through your mind. Um, growing food does save you some money in groceries. It may not seem like it, but really it does because you're just buying the seed and the seed produces so much more. And that's something to, to pay attention to um, because you can buy you know, those same products and spend so much more money by buying the product. Um, the food you grow is guaranteed to be fresh, obviously, because you're growing it. Yeah. Um, it doesn't get recalled, right? <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> and then of course, um, commercially grown, uh, produce often lacks nutrients and that's sad, but it's true. If they're putting all these pesticides and, and treating it to get to you, to the grocery store, you may lose some nutrients there. Um, and of course, when you garden, you can also control what goes in and on what you grow. So that's a big deal. Um, I don't know if you know, but since around 1940, we have seen a decline in produce nutritional value of up to 40%. Wow, 40%. On average, vegetables today have significantly less minerals, vitamins, and protein than vegetables did less than a century ago. So I can see why you, you know your grandfather probably did a, a great job with his garden. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, we're not treating the earth the way we should be treating it. And I think that has a lot to do with why our produce is the way it is today. Exactly. 
So why should we do this? Um, you know, there, there are reasons for, for us to do mostly gar growing our own food and, and buying the minimal. Um, food producers use fertilization, irrigation, and other means common in industri industrialized farming to increase yield um, so that they can lower the produce price. But these methods have been found to also decrease produce quality, quality obviously. So you lose the quality in there. Um, genetic dilution effect. Much of the food grown commercially now comes from the hybrid plants developed to quickly produce hardy yields. Again, often at the cost of quality. So supermarket vegetables may be short on nutrients, but you know what they do often contain? Pesticides. So strawberries may contain as many as 40 different pesticides. Celery may contain more than 60 different pesticides. Cucumber skin may contain more than 86 different pesticides. Wow. So, you said 86 on cucumbers? Exactly. Wow. That's, that's, that makes you think. Okay. Well, guess what? Research about gardening has shown the health benefits of it. And so um, I wanted to share with you about a researcher, Dan Butner, who has studied five places around the world where residents are famed for their longevity. Uh, in Japan, uh, in Costa Rica, in Greece, uh, Loma Linda in California, and uh, Sardinia in Italy. Uh, so people living in these so-called blue zones have certain factors in common, social support networks, daily exercise habits, and a plant-based diet for starters. But they share another unexpected commonality. In each community, people are gardening well into old age, their 80s, 90s, and beyond. Wow. I know. Could nurturing your green thumb help you live to 100? It's like, that's the question now. It's like, you know, is this what's helping them live longer? Um, so it's interesting to see that on the list, that it's up there and in, in, in making you happy, how to become happy. Um, Dr. Bradley Wilcox of the University of Hawaii Studies, uh, centenarian, centenarians, sorry, in Okinawa, which is Japan, uh, which has the world's largest ratio of centenarians, uh, when you eat vegetables that you've grown yourself, it changes everything. They taste more delicious and it really makes a difference in the health qualities, um, vitamins, minerals, and all that stuff um, of the food itself. He, he uses the analogy of a chair. He says diet, physical activity, mental engagement, and social connection are the four legs. If you don't have one of them, you fall out of the balance and it can shorten life expectan expectancy. Uh, longevity isn't about one single factor. It's about not working too hard to share a constellation of them all. So I thought that, that, makes, was that makes so much sense because I was just going to mention, you know, gar gardening and people living longer is not just because they're eating. Well, yes, yeah, they're, they're, they're cultivating, they're using their hands to play with the dirt and do whatever. They're eating their food. So they have a certain pride. Exactly. From, you know, eating their own food. So it's, it's, it's all these little aspects. It's not just gardening. It's all these little aspects that go into with it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Very true. Very true. All those aspects are included in that. So one of the things I want to mention to end and close in summary is that, you know, the important thing is to remember, you know, we're all learning. So we're all taking in strides, baby steps to get to where we need to get to. So there's, there's no big, um, th this is, this is our life. So there's, this is not uh, something that you're just going to be like nonchalant about. We need to care about our daily choices that we make so that in the long run, we all benefit. Um, so this quote was very interesting because it's, it reminded me of how we can all support each other. Don't let your mind bully your body. Be patient with yourself. Nothing in nature blooms all year. So it's just something to consider because sometimes we get discouraged. We don't, you know, we don't have enough motivation or we think we can't, you know, eat healthier because we can't cook or, you know, there's so many things we can do to help each other and support our communities to learn how to buy fresh market foods and learn how to cook healthier items, simple things too. It doesn't have to be complex. So I just wanted to leave you with that encouraging, those encouraging words. And to also let you know that we're here to support in any way and to let you know if you want to reach out to us we are just average people just trying to make healthier choices every day and we want to include as many people as possible in this journey this health journey so this is uh, what we call our team 
uh, of people that are just on the same journey um, that we are in, in, in this process of becoming healthy and making that our lifestyle. Of course, these are our resources in this um, presentation. So I wanna say thank you so much for your time and listening and staying in with even my bloopers. So thank you, Nancy, for your questions and your comments and your feedback. I appreciate you and I thank you for joining me today. Appreciate you too. Thank you for sharing all the information. It means a lot.